Okay, thanks, Peter. Um, yeah, so as I said, my name is Lawrence, um, also referred to as Lawrence of JSON by one of our customers. Um, and the title of this uh, talk is Shredding Deeply Nested JSON One Vector at a Time. And um, yeah, the title is as it is because um, we integrated a JSON reader in, in DuckDB. So I'm the uh, creator and maintainer of the uh, DuckDB extension for uh, the JSON extension for DuckDB. And DuckDB, of course, is a vectorized execution engine. Um, and we can read JSON, uh, nested JSON, uh, straight to our vectors. Um, and it doesn't matter how deeply nested it is. So this is something that uh, relational database systems typically struggle with uh, as soon as they see nested JSON, it becomes um, they default to JSON rather than decomposing the values within uh, the JSON. And uh, we can do this in DuckDB because we have some uh, rich nested type support uh, for lists and structs. Uh, so today I'll talk about um, why we want to use, uh, why we want to read JSON with our relational database. And then I'll um, talk about uh, a lot of performance optimizations that I did um, to make to make reading this fast. Um, OK, so why do we want to read JSON with our relational database? Uh, well, why do we want JSON at all? Well, whether you like it or not, it's everywhere. So uh, you can't really get around it. Uh, and it's used a lot uh, in the web. And uh, so this is an example here. Um, a random piece of GitHub archive data, uh, which I used to, to benchmark and um, stress test the JSON extension. And um, there's a really cool website, GitHub archive, which uh, once per hour posts a, a gzipped um, new line delimited JSON file. And um, it's about all of the activity on, on GitHub. Uh, so why do we want to analyze? Uh, so why do we want to analyze JSON? Well, if you want to know what users on GitHub do, I'm, I'm pretty sure Microsoft analyzes these files very heavily because they uh, need to know what their users do, right? So how would you analyze this? Um, well, you, you typically want to aggregate um, over, over log files. So let's say the average pushes per user per day. And aggregating over JSON, um, how would you do it? Well, you could make a purpose-built JSON query engine, which uh, some have done, but then you end up implementing the relational operators anyway, uh, right? You want aggregations, you may want joins. Um, so I think it's better to just go to the relational database system and make a JSON reader. Um, so yeah, all of systems are great at this anyway, uh, but they tend to deal with structured data. And that's the tricky part, JSON is semi-structured. So uh, not all records may contain the same fields and uh, the data is not relational. It's not flat, um, it's, it's nested, it's nasty, but it's really flexible and, and easy. It's, it's easy to create the data. It's harder to, to analyze it. Okay, so how, how would we do this in a database system? Well, um, actually since the SQL standard of this year, um, I think there's in, in the SQL standard, there's now uh, JSON support baked in. So um, the people who make the SQL standard have, have seen the relevance of this, but um, many database systems already support some kind of uh, a JSON functionality. And um, it's kind of tricky to use so uh, or inefficient. So in general, you would ingest the JSON, but it's a single string column. and all of your JSON would just live there. And um, for transactions, it's nice. Maybe you put some, some, some data there, but it's also very wasteful because JSON repeats the column names in every record. And this um, compared to like your compressed relational data versus storing it as JSON, JSON could be uh, 10, 20, 100 times larger uh, than, than a good compressed um, columnar data. And uh, so storage is wasteful, but execution is also wasteful because to do anything with JSON, you parse. Uh, so um, a lot of systems implement these JSON extraction um, functions, uh, which we also do. So here we extract the uh, value uh, behind the key 
duck from this uh, from this JSON object, and that gives us the string goose. But of course, the JSON is parsed, and then we get the value from there. And um, again, so storage and execution are uh, wasteful. So what if we could just query the JSON directly? Um, so not copying and ingesting all the data into the database, not fully parsing it to get one value out. Um, and that's exactly what I did in the JSON extension. Uh, we have direct, uh, we can read JSON files directly. So um, this is what it looks like. Uh, so there's a lot going on here, but here we answer our question, what is the average number of commits per user or pushes per user per day? And um, as you can see in the from clause in the CTE at the top, uh, we just have the string, uh, which is a glob for um, the GitHub archive uh, gzipped folder. And we glob all of the files that are gzipped JSON files. Um, and definitely recognize that as, recognizes that as you wanting to read all of the JSON files in there. Um, and it will scan all of them. Um, so there's a lot going on. So where type is push ID, and then we group by actor ID. And that is actually not in SQL, we would uh, typically separate table and column names with a dot, but in FDB, we can also separate uh, struct names with a dot. So this is actually the ID field of the actor struct, uh, and the struct was a object in um, was an object in in the, the original JSON file. Uh, so as you can see, the, the answer to your question is uh, 5.6 is the average pushes um, per day. Um, so in the folder, uh, there's 24 gzip JSON files, so one for every hour. So I downloaded one day of JSON logs, and it's about 2.2 gigabytes uh, compressed, so gzip. Uncompressed, it's 17 gigabytes, uh, and about 4.4 million records. Uh, but nonetheless, we are able to uncompress and parse all that JSON, and then do the aggregation in uh, 8.6 seconds on my laptop. So. Uh, without ever ingesting it actually into the database as a as a table. Um, so I'd say this is much nicer than the extracting the fields from from a, a, an ingested JSON. Um, and there's a lot of effort that went into making this fast. So um, let's get on to that uh, section. So um, we do parallel streaming reads of JSON files. So we don't fully materialize the file and then parse it. We grab a fixed size block and we parse that. And I chose 32 megabytes, which is a very big block size. Um, and it actually is, is less efficient than taking four megabyte block size. But our users actually tend to have some nasty JSON where single objects are more than 10, 20 gigabytes. So I opted for a large block size um, for convenience. And of course, a single JSON record needs to fit on, on a block. So that's why it's so big. Uh, but then the question, what if we cut a JSON in two? And we will, because our JSON is not aligned to 32 megabytes. Um, well, we keep a uh, thread global map where threads can see each other's blocks. Um, shouldn't modify them, but they can see each other's blocks and uh, reconstruct the JSON that was cut in two. And um, we can find where the JSON starts and stops um, if it's new line delimited JSON. So this is a format which was, which was made for parallel reads and JSON records are separated by a new line. Um, so what if it's not new line delimited? How do we reconstruct? How do we know how to reconstruct our, our JSON? Well, we don't, we can't parallelize um, non new line delimited JSON because it's very, very tricky to see if you jump in the middle of a JSON and you see a uh, opening uh, curly brace. Is that a new object or is that uh, a nested object? Uh, it's it's rather tricky to see. So um, I opted not to do this, uh, but instead people tend to have a lot of JSON files. So in this case, we can just parallelize over the files instead of parallelizing within a, a single file. Uh, yeah, so now we know how to get the data from the file in parallel. Um, now we have to parse it. And I didn't write a JSON parser. Um, I focused more on the database -y stuff and not so much on the JSON uh, parsing stuff. Uh, so I found a very nice um, JSON parsing library. 
it's called YYJSON. Uh, it's competitive with SIMD.JSON, but it's uh, portable because it's uh, written in NCC, no explicit SIMD, and it, it's very competitive in, in, in speed. I'm happy I don't have to write in, in NCC, but I'm very glad this uh, uh, author did. And it is really a beautiful uh, JSON library. Uh, the API is very in, intuitive. It's very nice. It's as nice as it gets for, for a C library. And uh, maybe something that's even better is that the author is really nice too because he makes breaking changes to the allocator API uh, for us. And uh, we're very grateful for that because that really speeds speeds up our processing. So why do we need a breaking change for the allocator API? Well, allocations can really bottleneck uh, anything you want to do on on if you want to do something fast on your on your computer, it can bottleneck anything. So allocations, uh, memory is of course a shared resource, and the operating system has to give it to uh, whatever process requested. And if the, any in any case there's a shared resource, there's some locking involved. And if we do a lot of al tiny allocations, a lot of tiny deallocations, we probably have to go through this lock many times, and this is going to be the bottleneck of our uh, whatever our program does. Um, so uh, what YYJSON does, it, it parses a JSON string into a parse tree. And if we naively allocate the parse tree, we get one allocation per node in the tree. And this would be terrible because per JSON, we could have hundreds of allocations if we have large JSON. So what YYJSON does, it tries to allocate just once. Um, it looks at the input length and uses some heuristics then spits out a number n and it says, I think we're we're going to need about this many nodes in our parse tree. Then it allocates um, n yyjson values, which are the nodes in the parse tree. And the, the nodes say, uh, have a tag, whether it's like a, a string or an integer. And then it has the value in there as well. Um, and then freeing is your responsibility. So if you read um, yyjson will allocate, but you have to free when you're done with the document. And um, luckily, you can plug a custom allocator into uh, anything that YYJSON does. And then you can man manage your memory um, a bit more nicely. And I'll go into that uh, shortly, but there's one thing I want to touch on. Uh, so what about strings? We have this fixed size YYJSON value, and we saw a char pointer in there. So does that mean that YYJSON allocates once for every string uh, that it encounters? That would also be wasteful because every key value has one string. So then we have, uh, again, hundreds of allocations per parsed uh, record. So uh, what it does is if the input is immutable, uh, we copy it. We just copy the whole input. And then we parse with a flag called in situ, which means we modify our input. And then we just point to our input. So the char pointers actually point to, to the input data. Uh, and then in some cases, if our input is mutable, which it in many cases actually is for our table functions, because we don't want to return the full JSON, we just want to return uh, the values that are in there. So we can mute the input. And then um, we don't have to copy over the data. And then we're still down to about one allocation per record. Um, now, in the case of the GitHub archive data, if we go through all of the data, that's 4.4 million records. So that's still 4.4 million allocations. And we'd like to get that down. So we use an arena allocator. And um, so this is our JSON allocator. It just uses an arena allocator. And the arena allocator separates logical and physical allocations. So if you request 16 byte uh, memory region from your arena allocator, it will allocate the 2K block. And then it will give you a pointer into that block and then increment its offset by 16. Next time you ask for a 16 um, byte memory region, it doesn't have to allocate, it still has room left in this block and it just increments its offset. Next, if you go over the 2K limit, it allocates a 4K block and then an 8K block. So your number of physical allocations goes down logarithmically with the number of logical allocations. So in the end, you end up only doing a few allocations per thread. Um, in total. So, uh, and we don't have to free because uh, we're a streaming engine. So we, after we're done with a batch, we can reuse the memory that was in the arena allocator. So that means for large files, uh, the average number of allocations per 
per JSON per record um, approach is zero. So um, yeah, we don't have to go through the operating system uh, so many times to request memory uh, because we have it all allocated. Okay, so now we know how to get the data from the file and how to parse um, onto schema detection. So we need to detect a schema before we can uh, instantiate the physical plan in, in DuckDB and uh, go on to transforming the JSON to uh, DuckDB's vectors. So um, this is very nice uh, with JSON that we actually have types. So um, uh, Pedro, who, who influenced our CSV reader in DuckDB was actually the jealous because he has to infer the types from the string and just try to see what happens. So this is already done by YYJSON for us. We have some types. And we can map the nested types like array objects to our lists and structs. Um, uh, so how then do we detect the schema? We make a very similar structure. Uh, so I call it a JSON structure. And this is very similar to this YYJSON parse tree. And we can put a YYJSON value into this structure. And we can put another into it and another. And it will merge the schemas uh, as we go. So we'll sample at the start of the file. We'll sync a bunch of um, YYJSON uh, parse trees into a node and out comes the um, merged uh, JSON structure. And then we can convert that to DuckDB types uh, using this mapping we see on the screen. And I have a question mark here with a string to varchar cast um, because JSON types are limited compared to DuckDB types. Uh, we have timestamps, we have UUIDs, and in JSON, this is all encoded as a string. So what we do is we um, try to see while sampling um, if all of these strings are actually UUIDs or timestamps, and then um, we'll convert those as well. And this is uh, this is for efficiency as well, because then we have timestamp. We can use all of our timestamp functions, and timestamps are uh, I think eight bytes, whereas the string would be much uh, be much bigger. And we do this uh, in a very similar way as the the CSV reader. We refine. Uh, the types, we eliminate types and uh, also date formats that might be in there. Okay, so now we have the schema. Now we have to transform um, the JSON data to DuckDB vectors. And um, we do this in a way that I call peeling off one layer at a time. So we have this large nested JSON potentially, and we um, have a batch of parsed JSON um, parse trees. Uh, let's say 2048 because that's our uh, batch size, our vector size. And um, what we do is instead of going one object at a time, converting all of the values and putting them in their vectors, we get all of the values that are associated with a key. So that's our, let's say, key one goes to our vector one, our column one. And then um, that might be a nested uh, a value. So that might be all uh, JSON objects. And then we just recurse. So um, it's like a vectorized recursion. Uh, but there's a problem with getting all values with key, key one. And that is that getting the value for a key is a linear search. Uh, the JSON parse stru structure doesn't really build like a hash map so you can efficiently get the keys. It's just the most efficient, fastest way to parse, uh, not to query. So if we do linear search and we're going to get all the keys, then that's uh, squared. Uh, complexity on the size of the on the number of keys. So the solution is to get all values at once. Um, so what we do is we create our own hash map that is a mapping from the JSON key to the column index, and then we get all of the keys. The, we get the column indices for all of the keys that we want, and then we put the value associated with that key uh, in there, and then we recurse. Um, so what is this JSON key map? So as I said, it's 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 a hash map. It's an unordered C++ unordered map from key to column index. Uh, but there's, a, again, another problem with this, and that is uh, hashing every key of every JSON object is expensive. We could have uh, 30 strings in there, and hashing strings isn't very nice. So what we do instead is we just interpret the last eight bytes of the string as an integer, add with zero if it's a small key. And um, I found that using the suffix of the JSON key was better than using the prefix because the prefix has a lot of collisions um, and the suffix has, has much less collisions. So um, 
yeah, this is basically a, a, a free hash function, it's a knob, uh, basically. And this also makes projection push down easy. So we actually push down projections into the JSON file uh, because in our JSON key map, we only put the columns that we want, the columns that we actually need for the query and all other columns uh, we, don't, we don't put in there. So then when we're iterating over the keys in the JSON value, um, we don't get the other, we, we don't get the hit for the other columns. Um, and that's actually what we saw in the, in the query that I did earlier. I was only getting this actor.id column uh, from the GitHub archive data. If I would have gotten all columns, and I think it's about a thousand columns, it's really big, nasty JSON, then the query would have been much slower. So this projection push stands really uh, important as well. Um, so just to recap, I'm close to the end here. Um, recap where you can look at the pretty duck. Um, so we did a bunch of optimizations um, to get for parallel, uh, for any JSON, we can do parallel reads. Uh, we use this YYJSON parser and we have a custom allocator in there that reduces uh, the allocations down by a lot. And this JSON key map also improves performance by a lot by having efficient lookups and projection push down. Um, and that's all I wanted to say. Uh, please check out the blog. Uh, if you just Google DuckDB JSON, you'll find the blog uh, has the same title as this presentation. And um, yes, thank you for listening. <laughs>